Imagine if you could easily find solutions to make your region or city smarter, greener, better connected, more social, and closer to citizens. The InterAg Europe Policy Learning Platform can help you. Access knowledge about the latest policy trends. Discover expert validated good practices from all over Europe. Find solutions in our peer review. Get tailored support from our expert team. We can connect you with the right people and organizations. Together, we will find ways to solve your region's or city's challenges. Start your policy learning journey today. Okay, hello everybody, and welcome to the uh, webinar um, on Twin Transition for SMEs, organized by the Interreg Europe Policy Learning Platform. It's, it's nice to have you all uh, joining us um, today. Um, this uh, event will be then moderated by me, Bart Veliste, uh, from the Policy Learning Platform. I'm one of the, the policy experts on the platform, and together with me is my colleague, René Denison. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Who will be moderating the, the chat. And uh, also with us is our colleague Lotte under the name Policy Learning Platform. Um, so who, who will assist with all the technical aspects. And if you have any technical issues, you can send a message directly to her and, and she can assist you with that. Um, so I know that there was quite a bit of interest in this topic. Uh, we have um, around uh, one, over 150 registered uh, people. And I expect also quite many of these maybe are not so familiar with the policy learning platform is, uh, especially maybe if you're new to the Interreg Europe uh, project world. And I just want to uh, say two words about that uh, before we go to the subject matter. Um, so basically, Interreg Europe has sort of two strands of activities. One are the projects. Uh, so projects, as in, in many other frameworks, they are around uh, consortia who, who tackle a common issue over a span of, of several years. And um, and then they reach the sort of common goals and outcomes. Um, but Interreg Europe is in a way unique because it has a second strand, which is called the policy learning platform, which really tries to sort of valorize the achievements uh, made within the projects, but also bring to the projects some new new knowledge. So it's sort of horizontal across uh, all the project activities uh, that we sort of try to open up the discussions and bring the benefits of the program um, to everyone. Um, and this is what we're also doing today with, with the webinar, um, as you will as you will see. And what the platform basically does in, in, a, in a nutshell is that it gives you access uh, to knowledge. So different uh, written reports as well as good practices on different policy aspects are available on our website. Then we provide expert services that were mentioned in the video uh, when you were joining. Uh, these expert video, uh, services are free of charge for policymakers across Europe. And then, of course, the main value is the people to the community. So those uh, 80 plus attendees that are currently in the call, but in a broader sense, uh, all the people that are, are involved in Interreg Europe and whose profiles you might also have seen or, or, or have searched on the website. So uh, it's, it's definitely a nice gateway to, to reach uh, many people across Europe. Uh, who are working in, in similar capacities um, as you are, because the focus is on policy learning and the main target group are, are European uh, public officials on different governance levels. Um, so that's the, about the platform in a nutshell. At the very end of the webinar, I will say a few words more about the expert services. Uh, but for now, we can go to the topic, which is twin transition. And before I carry on, I would like to sort of share a little uh, questionnaire or poll with you to understand what is the prior background knowledge of the people attending. So uh, my colleague Lotta has, has shared with you uh, this question where you can rate how familiar you are with on the topics of green transition, digital transition, and twin transition. And uh, yeah, of course, five is that you know a lot and, and one is that you know very little. So just uh, take a few, few minutes to sort of reflect on how well you know about the topic. And, and um, and then uh, we'll see what the results are in a few 
few minutes. While I'm still waiting, I will also say that uh, uh, the chat is the main tool uh, today in the sense that uh, after each of the presentations, uh, and during the presentations, you have a chance to ask questions, but please write them in the chat. And then together with my colleague, Rene, we will moderate it and we will ask the speakers directly what you wrote there. Um, so this is the way uh, we can have an engaging uh, webinar today. But I think we have a pretty nice uh, response rate to the questions, and uh, we can we can end uh, end the res um, yeah end the survey, and we can see then that um, there's a relatively good familiarity with the green transition and the digital transition, but uh, perhaps people are are a bit more cautious. On in rating their twin transition uh, know-how, which is very good because this is something that we are are tackling here today. And uh, let's also launch the second question, uh, which is uh, about whether uh, you are aware of any twin transition SME support initiatives or programs in your region. So a simple yes, no, uh, and you answer to the best of your knowledge. While we're waiting for these replies, I can also say that the webinar is recorded and afterwards we will uh, uh, also circulate the main findings of the webinar and you will have access to the presentations as well. Okay, and we can conclude the survey and it seems it's really sort of split in between. So some people are familiar with such programs in their region, whereas others are not. Uh, thank you for participating in this small sort of introductory exercise. Um, now we have a better understanding of the, of the audience, and I think it shows that you are in the right place uh, today as well. So why we decided to do a webinar on the twin transition is we saw that in the inter Europe community, there are new projects that are tackling this topic specifically. Um, Accelerate, GD, Turbo, and Scylla. And they look at it from different angles. So one looks at it from the clustering policy perspective. Another one looks at it in a sectoral way from tourism. And then there's also a skilling component in the third project. And while in the previous programming period, there were many projects tackling either the digital transition or the green transition. Uh, and we have done different events on this uh, in the previous years. Uh, this is really the first time that we're tackling twin transition where these two topics uh, come uh, together. And I think it's high time to do that because as we saw in this very brief survey, uh, there is still a bit maybe uncertainty about what does the twin transition entail. And, with, and this we hope to clarify with today's webinar as well. Here on this slide, I just put an image. You might have seen similar infographics uh, before. Uh, this one comes from uh, a a consulting group and then the World Economic Forum uses it as well in their communication. So the main idea of twin transition is basically that you try to green uh, uh, IT and data and, and basically also have sustainability by IT and data. So really the main point is not to look at them as parallel separate topics, but bring them together in unison and, and sort of advance the goals of both transformations at the same time. Uh, in a way that causes more positive synergies rather than does uh, does any harm. So the, the sweet spot is right in the middle where the digital can amplify sustainability. But that's all I will say about it for the introduction because we have different nice speakers here today with us. And I can also invite them on the screen to sort of sh show their faces. But of course, we have our keynote, Stefan Mun um, from the Joint Research Center, who will tell us a bit more about the conceptual side of things, uh, especially because he was leading a foresight analysis uh, con contracted by the commission uh, just recently, uh, where they looked at these two transformations. And uh, after his presentations, we have a good practice example from Ireland, which Ashling will talk about, this climate toolkit for business, uh, very interesting practice. Uh, then moving on, uh, our third speaker will be Jörbjörn uh, from, um, from the Research Institute of Sweden. Uh, he's going to speak about this uh, policy change they achieved in one of the projects in the previous contracting period. And finally, we are joined during the panel discussion by John Hobbs, uh, 
uh, who's lead partner of one of the new projects working on, on Twin Transition. Uh, and we will basically jointly reflect on what sort of what's the future uh, like in this sphere and, and how uh, local authorities and regional authorities would do more to support SMEs in the Twin Transition. So that's the main agenda for today. Uh, and uh, let's kick it off. So I will give the word, Stefan, to you. I will stop sharing my screen and, and you can take over and, and, and start sharing your presentation. Yes, uh, thank you, Matt, for the introduction. I will just share my screen now. Let me know when you can see it. Can you see my screen? Yeah, okay, perfect. Then um, so I will present um, a foresight study today um, on a green and digital future. Um, but before I go into the details of the results, um, just a few words on Foresight um, and on Foresight at the Commission. So Foresight is basically a um, systematic way of um, thinking about the future. Um, and since um, this commission, since 2019, Foresight really is at the heart of EU policy making. Uh, as for the first time, we actually have an executive vice president um, who is responsible for mainstreaming foresight in um, uh, EU level decision making. Um, and since then, we also have an annual uh, flagship uh, communication, which is called Strategic Foresight Report. Um, and in 2022, um, the report focused on the green and digital twin transition. In fact, there are actually more than one report. There are two that are published at the same time. Um, on top of the communication, there's also a science or policy report um, that is basically a summary of a foresight um, process, um, but is scientifically independent of the communication, whereas the communication builds on, on this foresight uh, report, this science or policy report. Um, but also includes uh, political priorities and also uh, includes a consultation of member states, for example. And as I'm from the Joint Research Center, I will, of course, focus today on the science uh, for policy report. So at the beginning of this research process, um, we were um, wondering what green transition actually means. And Mart already has showed a very nice uh, slide that basically says where we ended up uh, or how we ended up defining um, the twin transition, um, which is the overlap between the green and the digital transitions. Um, and here we looked at how digital technologies can support the green transition in the most polluting sectors in, in Europe, uh, which are the agriculture sector, buildings and construction, energy, energy intensive industries, and mobility and transport. But we didn't only look at how digital technologies can help, we also looked how um, where the tension points are, because sometimes they actually go against the goals of the green transition. So our time horizon was 2050. Um, and we um, took 2050 as a starting point and backcasted what has to happen up to 2050 to reach the goals of the European Green Deal. So we looked at uh, technology innovation timelines, at uh, trends we know will happen, how they influence these technology innovation timelines and how they influence the five sectors. Um, and we also looked at uh, non-technological factors that are important um, to make the twin transition happen. In total, this process took around eight months, and it was quite an open uh, process, um, a participatory, uh, participatory process, where we involved over 200 participants um, at seven stakeholder dialogues, and we made sure that we have a broad range of different stakeholders um, um, to also capture their uh, perspective. So we, we had um, stakeholders from the industry, the private sector, NGOs, um, EU institutions, and academia and research. But now to the results. But the first thing that came out of our analysis is that, first of all, it's not only about technologies, it's also about what we call uh, contextual factors. So we know that um, very often we can have a feasible technology um, that can address a certain challenge, but is not used for different reasons that are not technological. An example is um, uh, genetically modified food, for example, or crops, um, or nuclear power generation. So when we look at the twin transition, there are three main categories of uh, contextual factors, uh, factors um, that really play a role. It's social factors, uh, political factors, and economic factors. And this I will... Um, address uh, in more detail a bit later in the presentation. 
Um, now the next question, how can digital technologies actually support a green transition? Um, so we reviewed um, a vast uh, number of digital technologies, uh, things like AI, uh, big data management, uh, metaverses, and so on, um, and came to the conclusion that um, this is something that uh, doesn't help us to, to understand the topic. So what we instead uh, try to do is to actually extract functionalities that um, the different uh, digital technologies provide that can help the green transition. And so here we actually ended up with 10 functionalities um, that are helpful. Uh, the first one is monitoring and tracking. Uh, one um, uh, sector where this is uh, helpful is, for example, the industry sector, where um, energy intensive materials can be tracked and in this way um, it's easier to become more circular and um, it's possible to avoid having to produce all the materials um, uh, from scratch and instead use um, already used materials or secondary materials. Second functionality, simulation and forecasting is quite helpful to, um, for example, create digital twins of an area of the real world, for example, a city where a digital twin can help us to uh, optimize uh, transportation flows, um, but also public transportation systems. So for example, the maintenance intervals of, um, of buses and, and drums, um, but also how the, the, the bus routes are planned. Uh, third functionality, virtualization. I think we all um, have experienced this recently and uh, during the COVID pandemic. It's basically um, moving from um, real uh, into virtual spaces. Um, the same is also possible, of course, for shops, for example. Fourth uh, functionality, systems management. Um, it's basically um, about getting a lot of information and being able to deal with it. Uh, one example is in the agriculture sector where um, sensors can help farmers to um, use less fertilizers, less pesticides while keeping the yield constant or even increasing the yield. And last but not least, information and communication. Um, one of the um, application areas are uh, electricity grids, where we have more and more very, uh, very small um, electricity producers. All the households with solar panels on their roofs, for example. And uh, this actually is quite a challenge for grid operators because they always have to keep um, electricity um, production and electricity consumption in balance to avoid blackouts um, and hear real-time information uh, using modern information and communication equipment is absolutely essential to make sure that the grids are stable. So one thing that um, our study also includes are 10 case studies where we look um, at certain green digital solutions, two for each of the sectors we cover. Um, and here um, we um, have done a sustainability assessment. And that means that we looked at social, economic, and environmental implications of, of each of these green digital solutions. Um, and that allowed us to, the, uh, to um, identify challenges um, for these solutions to be rolled out. And on the basis of these challenges, we can formulate key requirements um, that can be um, used to overcome these challenges and to make sure to increase the probability of a successful twin transition. So um, we have um, several key um, uh, requirements and we, um, we cover uh, a few different areas, social, technological, environmental, economic, and political um, issues. Uh, let me start with social issues. Um, here it's really um, extremely important that um, we make sure that there is a um, acceptance in the wider public um, for the twin transition. That, that means it has to be just. Um, it cannot be um, at the cost or on the cost of um, uh, of vulnerable households, for example. Um, and uh, another thing that's also quite important is that um, many of the solutions we looked at uh, require data collection. And it's important to make sure that only the data is collected that's really used and needed, but also that this data is anonymized, um, that, that privacy is basically protected of, um, of citizens. Uh, technological key requirements. Um, includes the implementation of an innovation infrastructure. So basically making sure that all the infrastructure is in place that is needed by technologies. Um, uh, broadband internet is an example that is not everywhere available, particularly in rural areas. It's also important to have a coherent technology ecosystem. And that means that 
different parts, different technologies um, can actually communicate with each other because it is so important that um, data is um, uh, is being able is, is able to be used by, by by other participants of the system. And here again, it's very important that while data is transferred, that this is actually um, secure. So basically, privacy and security are absolute um, cornerstones of the train transition. Uh, environmental issues. Um, uh, here's one thing that is called uh, rebound effects, which are basically um, negative impacts of a solution that initially had a positive intention. And let me give you an example. So if you um, use electric vehicles to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in the transport sector, which is um, by itself actually quite a good thing, um, it can happen that everyone uses an electric vehicle to go to work comes back home in the evening, and then at the same time, the whole street plugs in their electric vehicle. And uh, this, of course, is quite a challenge for the grid system. So here, we have a solution in the transport sector that leads to uh, problems um, in another sector. And this is what uh, we, re we refer to as rebound effect. Um, and here, we have quite a few when it comes to green digital solutions, and we have to be careful to manage the, the impacts of that. Secondly, um, when we talk about digital technologies, we always have to also um, account for their environmental footprint because they also, of course, pollute. And we have uh, to not only use them to green other sectors, we also have to green uh, digital technologies themselves. Economic issues, it's really all about creating a market environment where um, the uh, often less mature um, green digital solutions have to be able uh, to be rolled out and scaled and also to be able to compete with already existing technologies that maybe would not bring us uh, to the goals of the European Green Deal. We also have to look at um, a continued, continued diverse market. And uh, with that, I mean that there's a risk that because everything gets more complex with digital technologies, small and medium um, uh, sized enterprises actually might be pushed out of the market, which is of course um, bad in the long term and uh, generally bad also from a regional perspective. Um, the same applies to skills. Um, I'm not worried about big companies to be able to reskill or upskill their employees, but with SMEs, um, this is really an issue. And here we need support systems to make sure they can also deal with these more complex technologies. And lastly, political issues. It's basically about supporting all uh, the other areas. It's about um, implementing standards that technologies can communicate with, with each other. It's about uh, making sure that there's policy coherence, not only between member states, but also uh, between different levels of governance. So between the federal, regional, and local levels. And lastly, it's important to funnel um, investments into the right technologies, uh, not only public procurement, but also private investments. And this brings me to my last slides, um, a few high level takeaways from, from this report. So first of all, we always have to think about not only the advantages, but also the disadvantages of a certain solution. Secondly, um, we make a call for frugal innovation. So to only use uh, digital technologies where they really are needed and where they really can make a difference when it comes to the European Green Deal in the context of the twin transition, of course. Um, third, um, we need transdisciplinary approaches. And by that, I mean, we should not only look at um, a technology, but also at all the contextual factors. Um, that are important for rolling out a technology at scale. And lastly, um, Europe does not uh, act in isolation. It cannot develop all the technologies needed on its own. It doesn't have all the raw materials needed for the transition. So it's really about making sure that um, this is a global effort and not only a regional effort um, by the European um, Union. And with this slide, um, I thank you for your attention and um, I finish my presentation here. Thank you, Stefan. And thank you for the very sort of good intro to the topic, which we have not tackled on the platform before. So also opening up the complexities of, of the subject matter. Um, Rene has also joined us here. Um, so uh, yeah, let's take some, some questions. So Rene, I give, give word yes. to you. Um, uh, thank you for, for a very good presentation and I was just thinking that uh, based on the foresight analysis which, which you have done, what would you recommend to local and regional policy makers uh, in, in the context of twin transition of course? 
Yes, um, very good question. And um, I think out of the key requirements, there are really three that um, I think are most relevant for local governments or local um, uh, decision makers. The first one is about uh, the infrastructure. So it's really important that um, uh, regions have the infrastructure to roll out uh, the solutions needed for the twin transition. The first point. Um, and here, what uh, local governments can do is, of course, when there are um, support systems, support programs to make sure that um, these infrastructures are included um, in, in these support programs. Um, a similar um, issue about SME support and also skilling support. Um, this is really something that I think um, is uh, absolutely crucial because we don't want SMEs to disappear. They are really a backbone of the European economy and we have to make sure that um, they get a support that they can't um, 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 so support and reskilling as they will not be able to do this on their on on uh, on their own. So this is really something where also um, not only EU programs but probably in this case even more national programs are required um, to to support these smaller players in coping with the increased complexity. And uh, third, policy coherence. So it's really important that. Um, uh, there's alignment between local, regional, and um, national and EU policies uh, to make sure that these um, um, levels or levers don't uh, work against each other, which sometimes is actually the case. So we really need a common understanding of where we want to go. And then we need it has to trickle down or bottom up, it has to trickle up from the bottom um, to make sure that everybody is on board and uh, is um, uh, kind of pulling into the same direction. Thank you so much. Uh... While looking at uh, the chat, whether there are any questions, I would encourage all the participants to put the questions to the chat. But I, I do have another question. While we might wait for some questions coming from the audience, your analysis uh, put emphasis on the uh, social uh, uh, dimension, uh, including the importance of acceptance and uh, mm -hmm. awareness. Uh, and your study also talks about avoiding rebound effects. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate uh, what is meant by this and uh, and why why you think it's so important? Yeah, I already gave one example in the presentation of what a rebound effect is, and this is not the only one. I mean, uh, there there are endless effects um, that that can happen. So what is really important is that um, uh, we are aware. Um, or once uh, a green digital solution is rolled out, we become aware of, of rebound effects if they happen. And that um, uh, we use um, policies or um, information campaigns to make sure that uh, that these actually don't, um, don't turn into bigger um, problems that uh, indeed might you know, endanger grid stability. So it's really also about um, uh, about knowledge of users. Um, the example I gave before was uh, child plugging in your, your car at the same time in the evening. And this is something that can also be tackled with behavioral um, uh, changes, but uh, people have to be aware of this. So it's really also about education um, um, that this will not happen. So, um, but it's, a, it's an integral part of, of um, the twin transition. And um, this certainly has to, to be considered when uh, thinking about which technologies can bring us um, to our goal in 2050. Thank you so I can much. also uh, have yeah. one question yeah. when I was listening to you, Stefan. You mentioned in the in the final slide about the frugal yes. innovation. And I'm not sure if the frugal innovation term, term is familiar to all. So maybe you could still sort of uh, briefly explain what, what, what is meant by it and what is the significance in the context of twin transition? Why, yeah. why should we look for frugal innovations is the question. So um, why um, is because um, everything we produce as humans um, I would guess uh, I, I would have the the basic fundamental assumption: that everything we produce is bad for the environment. So um, the less we produce, the better. Uh, when it comes to frugal innovation, it's basically about not rolling out fancy digital technologies just because they are there and because it makes us look like um, uh, people from the future. It's really about where do they make a difference? Where do they help? A sector in uh, reducing their emissions and reducing their environment, their environmental impact, and then, first of all, that has the, the first point that is uh, positive by looking at frugal innovation is that in this case the scarce resources we have can actually be used for those technologies that, that really help us, and secondly, we avoid producing a lot of um, 
um, uh, high tech garbage that in the end doesn't help us. I like the term high tech uh, garbage. It's, uh, it's yes. an, it has an interesting sound to it. But the point was clear. Um, well, thank you very much, Stefan. We will see you still in the panel at the end as well. Uh, but now I would I invite um, Ashling um, to, to join the stage and, and start sharing her screen to walk us through an interesting uh, practice uh, you've been, do, been doing in Ireland. So please. Um, and we, we can sh see your screen. Great. No, great. Thank you very much. And um, thanks Vanya, for giving me the opportunity. I'm going to talk to you this morning about the Climate Toolkit for Business. Um, which was developed by the Irish government jointly by my Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment and our colleagues in the Department of the Environment, Climate and Communications. Um, first of all, I'll give a quick um, mention to, to Dr. John Hobbs, who's leading on the Accelerate GDT uh, programme here in Ireland um, and who's, who's kind of invited me in, in to speak to you today and has been great to, to give me an opportunity to, to showcase the toolkit in this way. So thanks, John. Um, so yeah, how the toolkit got started, um, and then I'll, I'll kind of do a few screenshots and a few demos of what it actually does. So it was really aimed to provide SMEs in Ireland with a single point of information um, and in a complex policy space to really answer the question for them, where do I start? Um, as I said, it was a joint project um, across government. And we also um, were led by a steering group with a number of other state and, and business organizations. Um, and crucially, it was it was both public and private sector. So we had um, our local enterprise offices, our Enterprise Ireland, um, IDA Ireland, IBEC, our um, Business and Employers Confederation, our private sector businesses, and then a lot of other organizations that provide um, support and and skills um, and advice in this area. Um, so what is it? It's simply a carbon calculator tool um, and a climate action plan generator aimed at Irish SMEs. So the website provides SMEs with practical ways to take action to reduce emissions. And as I said, it also signposts available supports from the state. And the hope is that this will be really a learning tool um, as well as everything else that help SMEs increase their resilience and to, to remain competitive in the low carbon economy of the future. So I'll just take you through a few screenshots now of, of what the toolkit looks like. Um, the URL is here on the slides. I'd encourage you to go in and have a look and, and try it out for yourselves. Um, so we have a, a button here on our homepage to get started and that brings users straight into our carbon calculator. So the first part of that is some simple information about their sector, the size of their organization and whether they own their buildings or not. And this information is used to help tailor their the recommended actions and supports. So particular sectors might have particular supports available that they will be targeted if they click that they're in that sector. And similarly in size, so some supports will be more geared towards smaller organizations um, and whereas some of the actions we might be expecting a little bit more of larger organizations when it comes to recommending actions in their action plan. So if we click in through next step, we can see at the top here, the, the tabs in the calculator itself, um, we've got our four key areas of energy, travel, materials and water. And this information is used to, to build up the estimate of the, the business's carbon footprint. Um, and then the actions that they're recommended in the end will also cover these four um, kind of thematic areas. So the, the energy one is kind of by its nature, the, it seems the most complex here because there are so many different factors, but really this information is, is visible from, um, most users can get them on their electricity bills, so they can kind of put the electricity in in kilowatt hours or in their euro value, and similarly for natural gas and if they use heating oil, et cetera. Then if they click through, they can go into the travel tab, which they'll enter the number of business flights they take, and then their petrol or diesel, the amount of kilometers per year they use there. There's some questions on materials use. And then the, the final tab here is, is kind of water use. And then if they click to generate their action report, the, the user will get a, a simple um, visual representation of their carbon footprint. So it shows them very clearly um, 
software in their business, their, their um, carbon footprint is really rising. Um, for many businesses, or most, I would guess, their, their energy use is going to be one of the biggest parts. So on this one here, the big green chunk here in this donut chart is their energy um, with travel, waste and water making up um, the rest there. And then they'll be given a, a numerical estimate of, of their, their carbon footprint in, in terms of CO2 equivalent. Um, then the crucial part really then is the action plan um, that will be provided, a uh, tailored action plan for each business. So as I said, this will be based on the information they've given us, um, their, their energy use, their size, their sector, and all of that information. This action plan here, um, I'm showing as an example, has 14 actions. Um, and they can be subfiltered then so as not to be too overwhelming into actions to get started, to embed, or ones that are more strategic. Um, we start by recommending that everybody appoint a member of staff um, to be a sustainability champion. This is for a very small business. For larger businesses, we might recommend that they um, appoint somebody at board level to, to lead their, their climate journey. Um, we, where there's training or supports available, we will include them in the recommended action here in a lovely clickable blue box here. They can just click into that and it will bring them straight in. This one here is for our Sustainable Energy Authorities Energy Academy. So that will bring them straight through into that and they can start looking at that support that's available. Just a few more, you probably can't read these, but just to give you an idea of what the, the actions look like. And um, again, where relevant, there's, there's clickable links to supports that are available from state agencies. So this can be grant support, it can be information. Some of them can be um, low um, interest loans that are available um, to help them. And then we have little kind of tags here as well, just to kind of say this one green one here is kind of, this is a cost saving action, or this one here is a high impact action, just to, again, to further, you know, let, let the businesses prioritize, I suppose, where they want to go first. Um, so, so that's it. Just a few more words about um, our um, our take up at our engagement. It was launched in December 2021, and so kind of registrations have been growing steadily over that time. And um, we've this one here. Uh, this is users that have viewed their climate action report. This we kind of treat as the key metric. This is the number of users who have clicked through. Um, the calculator and generated their action report. So we're building on it, we're working on it, and we're, we're constantly looking at ways to um, improve the uptake of the, the, the toolkit. And um, so finally, just a few words about our kind of ongoing work and our next steps. Um, this is an example of a social media post we have. So we've kind of ongoing social media campaigns and we design kind of new visuals um, just to make it look a bit more attractive and to, to kind of get the message out there a bit more clearly. Um, we've linked the toolkit to a number of state supports. So with the local enterprise office there, their kind of support grant offering, we will recommend that users that want to uptake that grant will have engaged with the climate toolkit first. So they have a little bit of a better understanding um, about how they're going to use that grant money. So that's helped us with uptake and helped us with kind of the policy coherence that, that kind of Stefan spoke about, just to kind of keep things all aligned there. And um, we regularly update the toolkit as well. So um, every quarter we'll reach out to all the organizations who kind of link in with their grants to make sure that it's up to date. Um, and this year we're hoping to as well kind of start looking a bit more at phase two. And um, so things that might be included there would be kind of a little bit more of a look at scope three emissions and giving users an opportunity to track their emissions reductions over time a little bit more, or maybe to, to help SMEs support their, their compliance with um, the, the CSRD and other requirements, um, particularly for SMEs when larger companies are looking through their supply chains and expecting certain things that that might help with that. And um, so, so thank you very much. Um, that's me. Um, and I will see, can I stop sharing now? Yeah, yep. thank you very much. Happy to yeah, take sorry. any questions you might have. Thank you very much for running us through how, how it works and, and showing us the, yeah, the, the screenshots as well of how the tool actually, um, how the, how the SME faces the tool. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Rene has joined us and I do see that there are been some questions. So please, yes, Rene. Let's, uh, let's go immediately to the questions we got from the audience. So I will just quote some. Um, so uh, thank you. I 
Aisling for the very interesting presentation. Sorry if I missed this information, but is the toolkit recommended compulsory for companies uh, wishing to access public procurement call? Is this an incentive for them to use it? At the moment, it's not compulsory. Um... We linked it earlier um, during kind of the, the, the real height of the, the energy price crisis. And um, we rolled out, the government rolled out a support um, for, for, to help businesses with their energy costs. And it was linked to that. And we recommended strongly that customers, they had to kind of take a box on the application to say that they'd engaged with a carbon calculator and started kind of looking at their carbon footprint a bit more um, before they, they kind of drew down the support. But it wasn't made compulsory, but it was kind of strongly recommended. And we continue to take that approach. Um, uh, on the public procurement, I spoke very closely, actually, to colleagues who developed a separate tool um, on green public procurement. And so there are a lot of alignments between the two. Um, but that's something else we could think about looking at, actually, in phase two of, of the climate toolkit, um, which is kind of business facing, really. Um, but it has informed the, the kind of the, the similar toolkit for, for policymakers and for, for public procurers so that they do kind of align. Thanks. Thank you so much. We have two more questions, so I will go on. Do you plan to monitor the results from the programme? Which sectors have mostly applied to the toolkit? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, it's been a mix of sectors, really. Um, one we've particularly had success in, though, is um, tourism and hospitality. We've linked up specifically with our colleagues in Fulcher Ireland, which is our, our tourism, national tourism body. Um, and they've kind of further developed the, the toolkit for their own sector um, by kind of linking it a little bit more closely to their supports um, and embedding parts of our toolkit in their own website and their own kind of corporate offering. So that's led to an awful lot of success in that sector. And um, so we're hoping to maybe make kind of strategic partnerships with other organizations and other sectors to do that. Um, and I know I've been talking to John and some of his colleagues as well down in, in Munster Technological University about maybe looking a little bit more at SMEs man, um, manufacturers, the small manufacturing businesses and how the tool might be applied to them. So we're, we're looking forward to getting um, started on that. Thanks. And sorry, the final one. Uh, has there been any dialogue uh, with other countries or authorities about the tool? Yeah, um, we've talked um, on a few international forums. I think I, I spoke to the Maltese Chamber last year. I think they were interested in, in looking at something similar for their businesses. Um, and with the, with the good news coming from the north today, I'm going to be looking at doing a bit more cross-border um, as well with, with the um, assembly um, hopefully getting restarted soon. So with some of my colleagues in the north of Ireland um, looking at a few cross-border things there and working with Intertrade Ireland, which is our, our kind of cross-border trade organisation. So i um, very much looking forward to getting linked in with some of that as well. But happy to talk to anyone else who's interested. So anyone on the call who, who's interested and wants to kind of, my contact details are on the slides, um, very happy to talk about how the toolkit might work in their context or how um, they could possibly learn from what we've done. I just saw another question coming in. Perhaps this can be the final one we can take. Uh, uh, is there any plan to distinguish between SMEs working with a tool and those who don't, uh, like giving them a label if, uh, if any if an improvement is uh, monitored there, uh, that's a question. Uh, it's something we did think about um, when we were developing it was, was maybe could there, you know, be some sort of, I don't know, badge or recognition or some kind of incentive to engage in it. We didn't come up with anything at the time, but it's something that's in there in the background. So we will certainly look at that in phase two. Um, and, you know, we kind of have to be careful as well that all of our kind of supports that are offered, they're offered to everybody. And we don't like to, you know, make things too mandatory or to be too heavy, you know, with that kind of thing. And I, I find that these tools are kind of often better if they're optional. And if you kind of present them to people in the right way, it'll be in their interest to take them up. Um, but yeah, certainly, um, I think in terms of especially supply chains, that something like that could be very useful. And that small businesses who've engaged with this might use it as a way of communicating kind of with the bigger companies in the supply chain. Look, we've engaged with this tool kit, you know, we'll help you kind of, you know, with your own requirements and all of that in greening your supply chain. So, yeah, we'll continue to think about that as we, we develop the tool and as we kind of spread the message through the year.
Okay. It's nice Thank to see so that there was uh, so much sort of interest uh, from, from the audience, um, which still leads me to ask you a final question, whether you have something you would recommend, let's say, to other public authorities who are thinking about creating a similar tool uh, in their own region. So okay, one, one lesson learned or some recommendation that you would want I to give? I think, yeah, the most important thing, I think, for us was to get everybody on board at the start. So to really reach out across all of the organizations and and in the early days of the project it, the, even just getting together to develop the project and develop the toolkit was a great catalyst in kind of building relationships anyway you know even aside from the tool that came out at the end of it so you know i'd know how to who to pick up the phone to and call in our environmental protection agency or in our energy agency and just making those linkages and, and including the, the relevant people in the private sector organizations business organizations as well um, and I think that's carried through into, into other areas of the of our work as well, aside from the toolkit. Um, and it's it kept the toolkit on their radar as well, and it's helped us communicate it because they were involved. And so it's in their interest to go out and and kind of sell it to to their their networks and members. Yeah, so they would have a buy in and their own skin in the yeah. game as well. It's a good yeah, point. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you, Ashling. Thank you, Renee, thank for, you. for taking the question from the chat. And uh, we'll see you also in the panel discussion. Uh, but now, last but not least, I would invite Torbjörn uh, to come and share about what they have been doing uh, in Sweden. So, Thank you. I think I'll start by sharing my screen. And you've got it, right? Yep, it works. We see it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for an interesting start. Uh, my name again, Torbjörn Jonsson, difficult Swedish name. Um, I work at RISE Research Institute of Sweden. Uh, we are a research institute with more than, it's, it's a merge with, with more than 40 research institutes and we have offices all over Sweden. Uh, I myself, uh, live and, and work within a uh, region North Middle Sweden. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this Inno Industry project uh, or, or some, some fundings that we got in the Inno Industry project, which of course is an inter, interreg Europe project. This project is closed, it's finished. Uh, we started before the pandemic, we worked through the pandemic and uh, we closed it just after the pandemic. So it's been an interesting uh, journey in that way. Um, project scope for this industry was uh, transformation uh, towards industry 4.0. Uh, that's uh, okay. We had a, maybe a longer headline, but this was the meaning of it: transformation towards industry 4.0. And the policy scope uh, for uh, the Swedish partner for Rice Research Institute. Uh, we were addressing uh, the operational pro program, the ERDF, Priority Access 3, that is investment priority, and, uh, and investment priority 2, then uh, supporting capacity of SMEs to grow in regional, national, and international markets, and to engage in innovation and processes. That is the scope uh, that we were working with. And... Uh, of course, when working within this scope, uh, we have, there are some, some, some extra um, very important policies to work with. Uh, it is, of course, the Green Deal. And the Green Deal was very early uh, adopted into the European industry strategy and, of course, uh, the regional S3 strategies. Um, and from the start, with the focus on achieving project goals with sustainable digital transition in focus. That is the wording that we started with, sustainable digital transition. Uh, but in the in action plan uh, and in the work with the action plan, we actually um, replaced uh, these words, sustainable digital transition uh, with the wording twin transition. Why? Uh, why? Uh, well, uh, the EDIH uh, EDI process was initiated uh, during, uh, and, and the program was released uh, during this project period. Uh, and we were very much um, enthusiastic by this EDIH process. Uh, and we choose to work with the twin transition uh, as a wording. Uh, it's not 
the same as sustainable digital transition because that one is broader, uh, but it pinpointed for the for the for the industry that we were working with. It really pinpointed the, the, the question that is uh, going as a twin uh, green and digital transition. Um, the action plan that we worked with uh, that was evolved uh, with two separate tracks. So that is two actions actually, but really two uh, separate tracks. Uh, first track that is implement something for real and implement it now. Uh, and what was implemented, that was uh, this project we transform in English at least. Uh, and very much initiated by the parts uh, of the innovation system where we were one part uh, really focusing on, on initiating this type of project. In the end, uh, the project was coordinated and, and run by the Reading, Reading Diableborg. Uh, and we put all remaining ERDF funds into this project. Uh, so it was the close of, of, the, last, uh, of the last period. Uh, it was operated uh, by, in, as a cooperation with several clusters, innovation organizations and so on, uh, quite a few within the region. But uh, our part of it were focusing on twin transition of SMEs, mostly industrial. Uh, and there were other parts in, in this project still twin, twin transition, that is green and digital, and also, also social in this part. We reached 240 SMEs. Uh, some plus 20 SMEs were really, really supported uh, with uh, external expertise in more than, in more than 40 projects. Uh, a project was approximately uh, seven to 8,000 euros. Uh, an example of these products that was more, more efficient supply chains, uh, more efficient work to, 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 to make the, the industry greener, uh, things that, as, that was initiating SMEs to take the first steps of, of a journey. Uh, and many of these projects ended up with, with uh, um, their own continuation. And you, in many cases, also using the same consultants that we have uh, purchased for them public, through public purchasing and, and supported them with. Uh, then they continued to work with these consultants um, after the project. So that is do it for real. That is one part of the action plan. Uh, and we did it with the project we transform. And the other part uh, that was to build a long time support for twin transition. Uh, and then uh, to work with uh, the EDI ages uh, was of course, um, again, uh, main part for, for that one. Uh, we put quite a lot of strength on, on uh, uh, the national prioritization of EDIHs uh, and, and to get Tillväxtverket, the regional, uh, the national agency for this regional part, uh, to, to actually uh, prioritize a good um, and, and relevant program for, for Sweden uh, to actually work with the EDIHs. So quite a lot of effort on, on the national level but then real impact on the regional programming uh, of the period 21 to 27 of the ERDF. Um, so uh, the wording in the IH is, I think it's mentioned five or six times in, in the ERDF program. Uh, and it is really for, for twin transition that it's mentioned. So the twin transition is really programmed into the ERDF uh, for uh, 21 to 27. Uh, in the in the regional yeah in the in the ERDF. So my recommendations uh, that is uh, interreg projects. Uh, they are long projects. There is a special process for the interreg projects, um, and it's very easy to to start uh, doing the best cases, uh, um, planning for the future, and so on. Uh, but it's very important that from the start uh, focus on achieving impact. Uh, you have to you have to really start looking at the impact from 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 the start of the project, and you also have to start the frequent dialogues uh, because they are essential. Dialogues with the stakeholders, dialogues with the with the with the um, target groups, dialogues with your um, project partners within Europe and so on. Uh, so 
you actually get the dialogues up working um, from the start in the project. We also realized that uh, even though it's it's a fairly um, static process of doing uh, inter Europe uh, project, but being agile is very important. Uh, we had to be extremely uh, agile because we, we faced a, a pandemic. So we had to do things in new ways uh, that worked, but it also gave us um, very good um, experiences on actually being agile and to do things in, in, in other ways. Uh, and that was very fruitful for the project. Uh, and don't be afraid of reaching out to the target groups, to the stakeholders, uh, to the SMEs during the process. Uh, Again, it's very easy to, to sit and, and, and wait and, and prepare and prepare and prepare and be finished. But be, by reaching out from the start and, and involving uh, both SMEs and uh, stakeholders from the start uh, makes the pro uh, products much more fruitful. Uh, and that is, um, I, I would like to, uh, to be stressed in, in the future, uh, the future programs for, for uh, Interreg Europe. And that was what I had, uh, but feel free with questions. Thank you. And before I give word to Rene to take the questions from the chat, um, I just wanted to say that um, I think it was a very nice way that how, if we if in the audience, we have people now launching their projects that were just started uh, last uh, fall or, or a few few weeks ago, then I think you, you have a great example of where they might end up uh, after these uh, three or four years. Um, and it was also really nice to see how you impacted both this sort of a larger scale policy with the ERDF uh, program, uh, but also how you implemented this, uh, let's say, practical project on the ground on this topic as well. And I wanted to have just one clarifying question on the We Transform project you did for the SMEs. Was it only, let's say, these publicly procured uh, consultancy and it was a very tailored program for each SME or did they also have some sort of a joint workshops uh, training sessions uh, so just just a clarification on the structure of the uh, of the support you provided to the SMEs there, there were some some uh, uh, to some extent there were there were a little process uh, with the companies uh, but the main part of it the, the main the main uh, part of for, for, for each uh, company that was uh, that was the, the consultancy, the external consultancy. Uh, we we held the process for it. Uh, we did the purchase and, and we, we we managed it. So so there was some process in it. Uh, but the main part for, for the SME that that was uh, the real project that they did themselves. Thank you. And then Rene, uh, give the yeah. words to you. We have got one question so far from the chat, and I will quote it to you, Tornbjorn. What was the most effective? Uh, let's see. The question disappeared. What was the most effective way of engaging SMEs to the project? Well, that was a ten thousand dollar question, as always. <laughs> How to involve the SMEs? But you have to you have to actually be on the ground. Uh, you have newsletters and you have everything uh, that you can work with. Um, that never scores. It's not. It doesn't score as well as you would like it to do. Uh, but you have you have to be there. You have to visit SMEs. You have to you have to have the connections. You have to work with other organizations like the industrial um, industry centers and so on. You have you have to get the support from your colleagues in the system. Uh, and again, don't be afraid of talking to people. Um, have to you have to work with a reach out. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Durban. And we got another question, and this is specifically about uh, what about the SMEs with less than 20 people? Did they participate? And uh, there's, a, there's a comment also that 96% of the businesses in my region are of that size. Did you address them in any particular way, or was it mostly larger industrial businesses? Now I would say uh, we have quite a lot of these smaller SMEs as well. Uh, if we say less than 10, it's trickier to get them on board, but less than 20, definitely. But um, And if they are 50, they are almost organizations like like, like big ones. So there are two, actually separate processes for them because they think they are quite big. Uh, but 
most most of them that we got on board were less than 20. All right. Thank you. Thank but... you so much. And I think it's just in time to move to the panel. I, I don't see any other questions. Exactly. So, far. so thank you, Turbjorn. And I invite um, the others to join uh, back on screen, so Stefan and Ashling. But I will first also invite John Hobbs uh, to join us um, in this part of the discussion. Uh, as I already said, so John is the lead partner in the Accelerate GD uh, project that um, is now tackling twin transition from the cluster policy side. And I would have the first question, John, to you. Um, so what have been your initial learnings since you started the project last fall uh, on, on the topic of twin transition? Something that to note, perhaps, and share with others. And yeah, did anything stood out from the earlier presentations that you would like to reflect on as well? Super. So there's a, a couple of different questions there, I guess. But um, uh, ju just to give, I suppose, a little bit of background on the Accelerate GDT uh, project, we're seeking to... I suppose, provide more support for digital and green transition through clusters. So I, I think something that, that came through uh, Torben's presentation there was connecting with SMEs and how do you connect with them and, and government and policymakers, how, how do they make that sort of connection and ensure they're, you know, meeting with industry's needs. And we felt, I suppose, uh, through clusters and, and cluster policy, that's the real conduit, uh, I guess, for businesses and, and government to come together and, and discuss and, and come up with the solutions for how we're going to meet these uh, th these real world problems that we have, I guess, you know, if, if we're looking to be carbon neutral by 2050, you know, how, how do we do that? We need all of industry on board and, and the clusters are heavily connected to industry, have their ear, represent them, I, I guess, you know, from a political perspective in terms of, you know, what are the overall needs for industry, et cetera. So we felt that um, by working with cluster policies, we could have an impact then on the on the green and digital transition. Uh, so that that was the sort of starting point for our project. And then we looked at, at partners, I guess, who are, you know, reviewing and and changing their their cluster policies um, in in this sort of period. And then we brought those together with the challenges of of green and digital and how we could integrate supports for that into the. Uh, uh, into those cluster policies so that we can have more of an impact with with industry. So I, I guess from, you know, when once we've when we started the project and, and you mentioned about the sort of um, the key sort of learnings or, or the things that we've um, discussed over the first, I guess, year of the project now that, that we've been working together, uh, some of the main challenges, I suppose, that SMEs are facing um, that we see across partner regions from from our co-learning events and, and our meetings face to face, uh, you know, SMEs are, are stuck for time, you know, they, they're they all time pressed, they're all trying to keep the lights on, keep the doors open, ensure they're, you know, they're selling, they're staying competitive, etc. So, you know, that their time is, is precious to them. Uh, I guess we're uh, the other thing I suppose that that stands out to us is, you know, often there can be a lot of the terminology we'd use, you know, from a European perspective, when we talk about twin transition and digital transition and green transition, you know, that can be lost on, on SMEs from, from time to time. And, and they get they get lost in, in the understanding of that or or how it connects back into policy. So it's simplifying that, um, you know, it, it is a real challenge across all the regions. And then Ashling mentioned in her presentation as well about the you know, quite often SMEs don't know what steps to take, you know, so when when they're looking at digitalization or when they're looking at, um, you know, the greening of their business, you know, there's often confusion and there's different directions they can go in. But with the timing and the understanding, you know, they, they need to know what steps to take and, and when to take those steps. So th those are kind of the main challenges that we've seen across our partner regions on, on a whole. Um, I suppose in, in terms of the you know, the, the benefits that we've seen from, from those that are connected or, or that are working on the twin transition, um, like customers are looking for organizations and, uh, and SMEs and, and all organizations to be more sustainable. And, and by customers there, I mean, you know, society as a customer, but also larger organizations as as customers of, of SMEs outputs and values added to, to products and services by reducing their carbon impact because they're placing themselves uh, I suppose more positively in, in, in consumers' eyes. Uh, being more efficient and, and utilizing some of these technologies can help you to save money longer term. And preparing now for 
you know, 2050 and, and what's coming is going to help SMEs to become more, um, uh, to, to build more of a competitive advantage. So th those are the benefits, uh, you know, I suppose that we've seen from um, from those that are more plugged into the twin transition, you know, as as the, the project has developed and, and we've moved across our regions to, you know, to have workshops and seminars. We've had one in, in Duisburg in Germany, which focused predominantly on, on sort of digitalization supports. And we've had one more recently then in, in Vienna, where we uh, presented the, the Climate Toolkit for Business as a, a good practice from Ireland, which focused more on the green transition. And um, so we haven't connected them uh, as of yet, I guess, you know, in, in terms of uh, promoting both the digital and, and green, but there's always flavors of both, you know, when we're when we're sharing and we're learning. Um, so I, I think you, you asked me as well in, in terms of, you know, key points that I picked up from the uh, the the other presentations here. So, um, you know, while, while I was listening to Stefan, I suppose, uh, you know, that sweet spot was really something that uh, that connected with me um, from from his presentation. You know that it's it's about you know green and digital working together. It's not one or the other. It, it's that sort of sweet spot where both can improve and and help uh, businesses. But also we have to be mindful of those sort of contextual factors which can determine success. And uh, you you see examples of that then I, I guess from Torburn and and Ashling's presentations where you know you have to ensure that um, society is sort of at the center, that the SMEs are at the center, that there's alignment across the policies, you know, um, that there's economic impact from from being, um, from being making these transitions for the, the SMEs that are involved as well. Uh, I, I liked also, I suppose, the, the, the sort of example Stefan was making, you know, about uh, monitoring, about simulation, about virtualization, you know, and, and how that's helping to to make um uh, to allow companies to make uh green movement i, I suppose and, and move their companies on you know by using digital technologies they, they can also uh benefit from uh from from greening of their organizations and also i suppose that the other thing that stood out to me was avoiding those sort of rebound effects as well you know and and we see those uh, those rebound effects from different programs and initiatives uh, and we've seen plenty of examples i guess from good practices where you know the intended outcome is this but something else has happened and uh you know it's it's important to um for us to discuss those when we're working on on, on projects as well i suppose from from torburn's presentation it, it's nice to see you know the impact of a project at the other end um, it's also uh, great to hear from from our perspective, from the Accelerate GDT project perspective, that you know they worked with um, with clusters and innovation organizations to reach the SMEs. So really, you know that that's the the basis of our project and and that sort of policy element, you know, because there needs that connect with industry. And um, I liked what he was saying, I suppose, about you know having an impact from the start. It, it's what we want to do, you know, in, in our project, and I think. Um, you know, being agile, we learned, everyone learned a lot from COVID, you know, in terms of reaching out and connecting and uh, and putting sort of industry at, uh, at at the center of things. And I suppose another part of being agile is, you know, engaging with your stakeholders, with your project partners and, and ensuring that even though you have an application and goals and aims and objectives, you also want to know, you know, what's important for us to learn together now, or what are our problems now. So, I, I think that um, that sort of connectedness with your your stakeholders, your partners on on a daily basis. I'm I'm connecting with partners and stakeholders for the Accelerate GDT project, uh, because we we need to stay connected to them. We need to ensure we're having impact uh, for for those as as the project progresses. You know. Thanks. So hopefully, I've answered some of those questions there. You, know, you answered both questions uh, perfectly and a lot of things that we can follow up on. Uh, also, still for the audience, feel free to still write some questions to the chat and I will then uh, be taking them on the go. But uh, Ashling, you have raised your hand, so please go ahead. Yeah, I just thought I'd, I'd jump in there just kind of from what John was saying about learning and kind of staying connected to, to stakeholders and things like that. Um, it, it just kind of reminded me um, last year at the beginning of what year are we now? 2023, the beginning of 2023, we had a new minister in the Department of um, Enterprise and he had the idea of Ireland is divided up into kind of nine administrative regions. 
Um, and the minister kind of a lot of can be seen in Ireland sometimes is this kind of this perception that we're very Dublin focused. So the minister was keen to get out and around the regions and kind of using the twin transition as kind of a thematic vehicle, I suppose. Um, last year, kind of almost every month, we went um, around the country on a series of nine conferences um, under the kind of tagline, building better business. Um, but it was really just an exercise, I think, for the minister to get out and listen to small businesses where they were in their regions. They didn't have to kind of hop on a train or get in the car or drive to Dublin for whatever conference about this green or digital transition that it was brought to their regions and um, I was there with the climate toolkit at most of them there was people from all of the energy agencies from the EPA you know with the supports that are available on information stands to you know literally hand out money almost to, to SMEs where they are down the street from where they have their business and um, and I mean, we've reflected on it a lot as a department and they're kind of looking at what they might do in terms of bringing it forward. It was really successful in some ways, but there was always kind of a little bit of a perception that you're kind of preaching to the converted, I suppose, and that the SMEs that kind of turned up were the ones that knew they needed to be there, if you know what I mean, whereas the ones that didn't know they needed to be there weren't there. I probably got that mixed up, but you know what I mean? Um, and another thing we kind of that evolved along as well, a lot of it was based on kind of panel discussions with local businesses speaking um, and initially in the early conferences um, there was two different panels so there's one panel on digitalization and then there was a second panel to discuss decarbonization but actually as they went on by the time it got to the third or fourth kind of conference it was realized that look they're the same thing you know these businesses are talking about similar challenges these you know why have two separate panels why not put the same businesses and people can be you know talk about this brilliant digital tool that they developed that saved them time saved them money and look hang on we're not using all this paper we're not using as many physical resources it's better for the environment too so i think that was great as well kind of um speaking to what john said about kind of joining the two um and I mean, as a department and as, as an economy in Ireland, it's built into our kind of white paper, our, our enterprise strategy um, that, you know, the twin transition, it's it's there, it's, it's how we're looking. And even from my own work and my own unit, I've recently, we've set up a new climate programs unit and we're now in the same division in the ministry as the digital area. So we're physically in the same place with the same kind of senior manager over it. So we're all moving in this direction of, of it being a twin transition and not as easily separated, which I think is all to the good as well. Thanks, Hassan. Thanks. It's, it's really nice to hear about yeah, how things have somehow naturally involved in that way uh, in, in the activities and now in your own structures as well. Um, this is a question to all, but maybe Gerbrun can be the first to answer it because this was something that was submitted to us before the event by one of the attendees. And we've touched upon it, especially John talked about it uh, now, but still I open it, open it up to all of you. And the question is, um, what are the main challenges uh, that SME, SMEs face during, during the process of twin transition? And uh, also what benefits can arise for the SMEs when sort of engaging with twin transition? So again, what are the, I guess, what are the convincing, the convincing um, yeah, how do we convince them to join our programs of twin transition in a way, right? Because they need to know what's tangible tangible results for them. As John was also saying, you know, they want to keep the lights on, the doors open, and they don't have time to maybe think about it. Um, so, but I'm interesting, interested in the Swedish context because you had this program specifically on supporting SMEs, giving them sort of the, the first um, push towards a twin transition process. But nonetheless, you probably heard some challenges or some feedback from the SMEs. So well, what was it? There are always, it's always very challenging uh, to get them on board that that is uh, we're quite a lot of witness uh, in these presentations that that is the most tricky part uh, and it's of course for us as well um, it's all about selling uh, and and selling uh, and, and letting others I, I saw in the comments here before as well uh, using the SMEs as, as agents uh, that's a good way uh, we produced quite a few cases uh, small films uh, what have others done? This was easy for us. We did this and this. It worked very well. And and, and using all this, um, um, using their witnesses, uh, the SMEs as a sale, 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 sales agents, it, it's a very good way of, pop, of, of putting it. Um, and it, you have also you have to be aware of that everything you do 
not going okay. <laughs> As we are prototyping, we are early stages, and, and you ha they have to be aware of that one as well. If they just go into it and do something, uh, and then they end up with, with, a, with a failure, uh, they have to be prepared that it could be a failure. Uh, else you start, start some, some negative things about it. Uh, so that is also important. Um, yeah, but I but, guess this, as long as this testing and failing is partially supported by public funding to take the first initial risk. It's easier. <laughs> it's, it's easier. It's easier in that one. But but you always also, as well as presented, uh, keeping the lights on and so on, we, we also use their time and they use their time. Even if, if the external funding comes from, from other money, it, it's, we are still using their time and, and their own time. That is the most precious things they have. And they have to, they have to all, all, always, they have to keep it in, in mind using their own time. So, um, but to, to get them on board, but I would say um, using the other ones as agents, that is the most critical, that is the most critical way of selling, I would say. Um, does anybody else from the panel want to jump in on this question of the main sort of challenges that SMEs face and how do, and what sort of the, uh, the benefits we can communicate to them? If I may add something to this. So um, one thing that also John said uh, that really resonated with me, and this is that um, it is difficult sometimes for um, SMEs to know what step to take. Um, and I've, I fully agree with this. Um, I think one of the real big issues for SMEs is that um, uh, they don't have the same capacity than big uh, um, companies to have experts for all kinds of uh, narrow questions um, in the company. They also have much less resilience when it comes to um, what Torbjörn said, to fail, because um, if you have, if one out of three projects fails, it's a bit much, um, a, a bit more severe than if one out of a hundred fails. So, um, and here we have to actually look at, uh, at the two transitions uh, separately, because we do have the green transition, and the green transition is one that is policy guided. So, um, we have policies that uh, try to arrive at uh, a certain goal in 2050, and we actually know quite well um, what kind of pathways lead there, uh, at least at a high level. Whereas when it comes to the digital transition, um, this is much less clear because it's not uh, policy driven, it's market driven. So there's a lot of push from, from different solutions. That it's very fast. It's not predictable. We cannot say what will happen tomorrow. So when it comes to the green transition, it's actually possible to, to prepare, to, to, to get, have kind of a compass uh, to know where to go. Um, the only thing, and here the challenge is that um, uh, there are these kind of pathways um, also published by the commission, but it's not the commission's place to tell an SME, you have to, out of five options, you have to take exactly this. So this has to come bottom up. And there, um, uh, an approach, uh, also again, that uh, Torbjörn uh, already mentioned, uh, the smart specialization, for example, is one of the approach, approaches that actually allows SMEs uh, to um, develop uh, specialization strategies that are in line with these long-term targets. It's a very good approach to actually combine um, a policy-guided transition um, with uh, a bottom-up approach. Um, when it comes to the digital transition, it's much more difficult. Um, and here, um, uh, what really resonates with me is the cluster approach that John uh, mentions, to, be, to, to basically have um, uh, points to which SMEs can turn um, to get support when it comes to things that are, that are not in their capacity. Um, to, to, when it comes to getting a clarity of which technology, digital technologies are important for them and how they can actually get the skills to use them. Thanks, Stefan. And I think in, I'm going to also take this question in the, from the chat that we had. And I think it was mostly, mostly directed to John, but it may be also uh, Dorbjorn, you can reflect on it because it's it's basically a question, how much have you discussed within your sort of consortiums or project partnerships on the social dimension that uh, Stefan talked about, about this sort of co the context of the social acceptance and awareness. Um, how much is that on sort of on your radar when, when um, you're working with the SME policy side? Yeah, John, please. So I, I guess it's it's something that we're we're always cognizant of, you know. Um, but it's uh, you know we we have um, particular webinars or, or workshops that we're focused on delivering as part of the project. But it's it's when we reflect on those and and where we're discussing as a consortium, 
you know, as, as part of the, the steering committees where we can reflect on how that would resonate, I, I guess, with society, you know, because for policies to have the correct impact, then, you know, they have to resonate for society, they have to be uh, advantageous for society and, and SMEs and, and industry is is part of that as well as the you know the citizens that are sharing the same spaces and, and living in the same areas and, and wanting to um you know continue living in a in a clean and, and good environment you know so it, it's something that we're cognizant of and that we're trying to get more involved in our discussions um you know as all of these projects I guess can be quite complicated you know because you have the the economic basis and, and the connection with industry and, and that, that can be the the sort of focus but we have to be cognizant to those and, and ensure that we're uh, we're connected to the the overall you know uh, and i can add in a few words as well and to, to be able to to be successful successful within a company you actually you have to focus on on, on the psychological safety uh, within the within the company um, and to make all the organizations more, more more profitable, more innovative, and so on. There, there are well, it's it's a known fact that, that for example, diversity is crucial to get this. Um, so yes, we, we we even if we have changed the word to twin transition, the, the total um, sustainable uh, digital transition, including the social word of it. Uh, so it's not only the green part; it's also the social part and 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 generating the economic part. So all all three um, econo all three uh, sustainable goals uh, has to be has to be uh, in target uh, to be able to succeed within the project. The social part is it, it's it's very important. If I may add something here, so one thing that I find uh, really mind blowing is how how quickly opposed um, society is. Um, when it comes to sharing data that is uh, for the greater good, um, it's just thinking about smart meters, whereas um, we uh, all have social media accounts and very freely share a lot of private details of us uh, with the public um, if it's in our uh, leisure area. So I think what we really have to try to achieve um, when it comes to the social dimension is to um, show what kind of um, advantages certain solutions have for people directly um, and this is something that we are very bad at uh, but it should be uh, like a cornerstone of every project yeah, that's a very good point there's a lot of fascinating research on this as well about what people are willing to share and what they're not and then it makes you <laughs> it makes you wonder but um something that i can i would still like to touch upon as a last uh point um is then this is what Stefan actually mentioned, but we haven't covered it in length. Is is this the skills gaps or or the need for reskilling? Uh, because I, I feel like there's a there's potentially I guess a threat that if we now in our local level put a lot of effort and time into you know let's do these uh, voucher schemes or grant schemes or SMEs to start their transformation journeys, but we don't de deal with the um, labor side of things. That will they have employees who can in the long run implement the stuff? Uh, then you know maybe we are we are going to the wrong direction. So I was just curious whether from the regions we are we have here uh, from Ireland and, and Sweden, uh, do you also have some examples of some upskilling or reskilling programs that somehow link with the twin transition? Uh, and I see that already microphones are being turned on. So maybe I think Ashley will <laughs> first. jump in there first if that's okay. Um, it's not my specific area, but I'm very aware of of a number of colleagues um across departments really because the, the skills area kind of moves across three different kind of departments and really um, we have in Ireland um, an expert group on future skills needs that's kind of looking into the future of what skills might be needed um, and they produced a report a few years ago I know on kind of climate skills and what kind of skills might be needed to decarbonize so that's been really useful um, and a lot of our kind of skills organizations as well are kind of developing more um, I know we have a program at the moment being rolled out on micro credentials so they're kind of small kind of you know things that can employees can take up in their own time they're usually very heavily subsidized so the company doesn't have to pay much if at all um, and, and employees are encouraged to to go online and, and kind of take a, an error uh, you know course or, or even kind of build on that so that's something that's and that's included in the toolkit as well we have links for relevant to to the skills supports um, and i know our energy agency have an energy academy that's very accessible um, 
and, and everyone is encouraged to look at that to, to develop. And, and they kind of start very small with what's called a sustainability pass. That's like a very short five hour program introducing the various different pillars of sustainability. And then you can build on that. So, um, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of work um, going into that. And it's it's really important um, just to make the focus about learning and, and, and upskilling employees as well so that they can adapt as their jobs start to change as well as kind of the green and digital transition kind of moves forward and um, the nature of how we work is going to change as well. So it's important that we, we bring everyone along with that. But it's nice that your tool already connected SMEs to those programs yeah. with, with the action plan recommendations as well. Uh, yeah. I, I think, John, you wanted to say something. So uh, last word for you here as well before we start closing. I, I guess my day job is um, is lecturing and, and I'm based at the Monster Technological University as well. So um, one of the things I, I guess I've seen, you know, in, in this sort of reskilling space is that you have large companies that are able to come to organizations like ourselves and guarantee, you know, 35 bums on seats for a particular reskilling course. Uh, but something we're seeing more recently now, you know, across Europe and, and definitely now locally here as well with, with other clusters, is they have the ability to bring those SMEs together and talk about their skills, needs and, and what they need for five years, 10 years down the line. So, for example, here, you know, we we developed the, the Cyber Ireland cluster has uh, is hosted in MTU, but it's a national cluster for cybersecurity organizations all across the country in Ireland. Um, they've worked with companies to look at what their skills needs are, what the next challenges are. They've brought in another um, large national project called Cyber Skills, which is all the universities connected in, into that and, and um, plugged into all the universities across Ireland. And they're now providing courses and uh, both online and physical courses uh, for those that are looking to reskill into the cybersecurity sector. So it's a, a huge sector becoming more and more important, I guess, globally and, and across Europe, uh, but also in Ireland now and, and finding the skills and the right skills to ensure those companies can can be competitive and, and uh, meet their needs is being delivered through um, projects and courses like that that are that are coming through clusters because they're the ones that are connecting, you know, what, what industries needs are. And it's great to see that that sort of impact there as well. That's really, uh, a re I think, a really nice example worth considering how we can replicate it in, in other sectors with other regions as well. Um, yeah, we, we will start closing here. So thank you for the panelists. Uh, very interesting discussions, very interesting insights. I think there is still stuff here to discuss. And knowing that we now have three projects on this topic and potentially more from the second call of projects, uh, I, could, I could foresee us having follow-up sessions maybe on the, up, on the upskilling subtopic or some other subtopics um, in the future. Um, but uh, as a closing uh, element, I would like to turn to the audience again. And we have one more sort of uh, question or a poll question for you. And uh, uh, Lotte, please, if you can launch, launch it. Uh, so it's, uh, what did you learn today? Uh, so we would be curious to see uh, what you what you write down. It's, a, it's an open-ended question. Um, it seems that uh, Zoom recently uh, updated their capabilities as well, improving their digital functionalities uh, and more sort of different type of questions uh, can be asked. So let's see how it works today for us. Um, while still waiting for some of the answers, I also just want to encourage people to also go back and, and uh, read the foresight study uh, that Stefan and his colleagues uh, compiled. Uh, there are some elements and layers that I think we didn't fully address today. Uh, there's also a lot of talk about the uh, inherent sort of, well, not risks, but maybe the also the climate impact that digitalization itself has and how the server parks uh, also have their environmental footprint and then how to balance that uh, when promoting the twin transition. So there are some interesting uh, things certainly still there. Um, after we close close the poll, I also will be saying two words about the expert services that the platform can provide for you. So uh, if you stay with us uh, two more minutes, then you will also hear about that. But um, uh, now we should have the poll results. And... I will share them in the chat, Mart. Okay, it's uh, so we're, we're learning on the go, but uh, Lotte will put them to the chat and we will all see it. So I won't be reading out them myself, but rather I will wrap up with what I, what I promised. Um, 
And to just say then that um, on the policy learning platform, we also have these two services called the peer reviews and matchmaking services. Uh, these are free for charge for uh, all public officials or po uh, let's say policymakers um, across Europe on different policy topics. So both related to SME policy, but broader, anything that goes under smarter, uh, greener or social Europe. So we're talking about education policy, culture policy, uh, environmental policy and, and innovation policy and so on. And uh, we have a nice track record of doing these different peer reviews and matchmakings. And that the peer review service is basically a one and a half day uh, tailored event or a tailored discussion where we come to your region with uh, four to five experts we've identified through our networks. And we come there to discuss the policy challenge you have. And really the discussion is tailored uh, to your needs. So the topic can still be let's say on twin, twin transition, but instead of doing it like a, like a webinar today with a lot of attendees, we would really tackle, you know, okay, how to best set up in your region, uh, let's say a similar uh, voucher uh, or consultancy scheme that um, was was presented today by Durban. And, and, then, and then we sort of discuss in detail in this one and a half days on, on what should be the criteria of such support, how should, large should be the funding, how to set up the public procurement and whatnot and whatnot. So this is just one example, but it's the bottom line is that it's really tailored to your needs. And uh, what you get out of it is that all the participants, both you as an applicant, but also the experts that join all learn in this sort of uh, exchange. Uh, a lot of knowledge is, is increased in that, in that way. And, and the hope is always that if you go through this exercise, uh, you might also be able to shape your poli local policies uh, better. Uh, and of course, as you're meeting with four or five other people from other parts of Europe, these are also nice sort of um, opportunities to initiate further collaborations on, on a cross-border or, or, or cross-regional and international level. Um, so that's just something that's there. Uh, if you're interested in it, uh, you can also indicate it in the survey that will happen once you close the webinar. And uh, we're happy to sort of send to you, send to you some materials and, and, and let you know more about it uh, if you just, just reach out to us. Uh, and it's a rolling basis, so it's always open. Uh, the call, call for peer reviews and matchmaking is, is always there. Um, and then, yeah, just uh, you're welcome to join our online community through the website and follow our newsletter uh, and um, keep an eye on, on our social media as well. So thank you all for joining today. Thank you again to our speakers and panelists. It was a really interesting uh, exchange of thoughts on the topic of teen transition. Uh, I hope we get to collaborate with you more and um, good luck in your work. And most of all, John, good luck with uh, the new project. Uh, hoping to see some interesting sort of good practices and results in the coming years as well. Um, thanks again and, and have, a, have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.